Hello, it's Scott Manley here with episode 31 of Interstellar Quest. Bill Kerman is out on EVA and he is going to demonstrate some new features of a Kerbal attachment system, which are, are pretty darn cool and I would love to see in the, in the original game. Now, uh, when I was taking this spacecraft up just on a repair trip, I thought, why not throw some uh, supplies into this little cargo hold? So I brought up a couple of lights. Since the original spacecraft, as we launched it, did not include any lights, it would seem like a good thing to bring along with me. After all, we have that nuclear reactor there generating, you know, all practically gigawatts of power, and then not a single light using it. So what we do is we fly up next to the space station, and then we uh, right-click on the object on his back. No, no, there we go. Right-click, and we want to attach, and then. There you see we drag it onto the body and there we go. That's it, we have attached a light. So uh, it's not turned on obviously. We will turn that on in a moment. Let's uh, fly up and grab the other one. I brought two, the other things I brought were kind of pointless. I brought fuel lines because I was originally thinking that I might have some trouble docking. Uh, actually, originally I, I put this in the cargo hold and then I thought, oh, why not uh, put a docking adapter on there and then never took them out? I could have brought some struts or something genuinely useful. Okay, well, let's uh, fly around the other side. So we, we see where that one's sitting. Let's try and get it roughly on the opposite side of each other so it'll you know, illuminate both sides of this thing in orbit. It uh, may have all these giant uh, arrays and everything sticking out. We want to have some lights on it so that people can actually see it when they're navigating in space. After all, something like this, you know, with its microwave transmitters and nuclear reactor, would be a menace to navigation if you hit it. Come on, attach it. Yes, nice. Okay, how does this thing look, I wonder? Come on, just try to kill the velocity just a little. Activate the lights and... Oh, beautiful. Look at that. You can see all those panels now. And uh, you can see the aircraft, which I uh, have just realized um, <laughs> is not the one that I built in my pr the previous episode. The one, this one here, was one that I built while testing for that episode. Uh, and it's not as good. It actually had uh, some instability issues and compared... Well, I don't know. We'll find out. It did not fly well. It had a tendency to kind of nosedive into the ground. Hopefully, hopefully I can balance this thing. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, with that in mind, it's time to leave Bill and, la and uh, land this thing. Thankfully, you have Jebediah at the controls. Yeah, the, the real difference you can see here is that it has three uh, tail planes and also at the back there is some uh, RCS canisters they're mounted at the back instead of in the an inline part of the fuselage so this is completely different and therefore we don't know how well it's going to fly it could entirely just crash ah oh, look at us going away here okay so what we got to do is deorbit ourselves and I think we're pretty much I looked earlier, we are more or less coming up on the anti-node, the opposite side of the planet from our space center. So once we're cleared, we will uh, fire up the engines and hopefully the space station will not be damaged. Those those uh, panels, those heat radiators, obviously we do not want to hit them with any exhaust gases because they could flap and fall off. But uh, Jebediah doesn't care. He don't care. He just want to get home. He's going to fly as fast as he can. Get himself home. Flying over the base. Over the... Over the... The center. <laughs> over the Kerbal Space Center. Okay, so I guess I'm a little late here, but you know what? We should be fine. And uh, after all, probably has plenty of cross, cross range capability on this. If we overshoot, it's fine. We can just turn around. If we come up short, we can we can burn. This thing is not a problem. I mean, worst comes to the worst, we point it at the nearest land and we fly over it. And yeah, it as you see, it's coming down. This thing 
is a lot less stable. I, as I said, I noticed that it was not the same vehicle. This one is a lot less stable. If you remember, I had to work very hard to turn the the one that I had built in the in the episode. This one is much more likely to flip out completely if I try doing that here. So there's a couple of times during this descent that I start to turn and then I see the velocity vector start and the position vector starting to diverge like there. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 let's put this back. Thankfully, I keep it straight. I mean, I think regardless, we'd probably be OK because we have the uh, the EVA parachutes there. So we'd be able to eject and land it and you'll land the crew. At least we wouldn't lose Bill and Jeb. But unfortunately, we did overshoot by quite a margin. So we have to turn around ever so slowly and without losing control. And there's the runway over there. We have a long flight back, but again, we have plenty of fuel. And you can see me occasionally turning too hard and having to push very hard to correct it back down. Uh, I, I think it's okay now. Again, this is uh, where I wish we I could have joysticks that wouldn't need to be remapped every time I... Uh, switch between a rocket and a base plane it uh, is somewhat somewhat annoying that uh, that problem is still in there i would really like to be able to adjust my control mapping inside the pause menu or at least have different control mapping assigned to the vehicle assembly building in the space plane hangar it would save me a lot of time anyway uh, firing up the engines we've obviously switched it to uh, atmosphere mode, we're sucking in air from the atmosphere, running it through the pre-cooler and then squirting it into the rocket so that we can generate some thrust without carrying any of that expensive and heavy oxidizer stuff around with us. Although we kept the oxidizer on board because we're going to use it as ballast. Coming up in final approach, we have hope. Wait, this is this is the time when I lose it, right? <laughs> this is the time actually when I crash. I do not have time to eject, but engines off. Just gonna kill the velocity. So I'm using RCS here as a braking mechanism. Just you see me firing the RCS, hold using the N key. Swing. Oh no, that was not good. Okay, now I'm really losing it. Running out of runway here. Okay, come on. Just touch down, touch down, touch down. Ever so gently. Yes. And we didn't lose the engine this time, you see? There may be some advantage in this other design, alternative design. Okay, so we have another mission that is going to our reactor in space. Uh, I decided that that reactor is in too low an orbit, right? I really want to put it into a higher orbit. I thought I was originally going to dock it to the spacecraft, to the space station, but I think it would be better served in its own orbit to keep that nasty reactor a long way from those guys in space. So yeah, full power running through these rockets here. It's the same launcher because the... Uh, the contents are in a 3.75 meter fairing and the mass is slightly lower but not that much lower so it's pretty much the same rocket with uh, you know different contents. <laughs> the, the shell contains a completely different secret which will be revealed uh, except that was it being kind of revealed there. You see it popping in and out. You know, I would really like a fairing system that you could anchor stuff to with struts. Just, you know, another thing for modders to talk about. You know, allow attachment to fairings might help, maybe. Because I think, if you think about it, the fairings are really attached to the, the interior. They, th they shouldn't be wobbling back and forth like that. Okay, ditching the stage. Ooh, eerily silent. I, if you watched the... If you watch the SpaceX launch, you'll see that they have like a good, you know, 20 seconds after they stage. I mean, they ditch that, they let stuff get a long way away before they actually lose the stage, before they actually ignite the next stage. Not the case in Kerbal Space Program. The margins tend to be too small to, you know, to do a 20 second stage separation in a launch that lasts two minutes. That is quite a large part of the launch cycle. Okay, get ready to ditch these engines because they're almost out of fuel. And... There we 
There we go. Go on. Look awesome there. Well, that <laughs> I, I hear kitties in the background doing awesome stuff as well. Kitties have been active tonight. I don't know what's going on with that. Okay, so main engine firing is accelerating us at a fraction of a G, but uh, we have one minute to Apple apps. The time is dropping very slowly. However, I suspect that uh, we have more than enough thrust at this time to actually get us safely into orbit without that uh, near miss that we had last time. As I said, the mass is somewhat lower, so this stage should accelerate a little faster. And you can get a I'll get a look at that at it now. It has a bunch of bunch of these um, radiators, bunch of radiators. We have a docking port in front. We have the lab unit there. Now the lab is going to be there because we want to refine or you know clean up. We want to basically take the fuel and recycle it. So we're attaching this to that reactor so that it will actually serve as a maintenance facility. Uh, we also have spare fuel there. We have uh, some docking ports so we can send up supply vessels and whatnot. And we'll have a crew. So the crew will be able to take the reactor, shut it down, you know, reprocess the fuel, refuel the reactor, and uh, keep the whole thing running. And I think my idea is that I'm going to dock another few reactors onto this facility. So eventually we'll have like maybe three or four reactors sitting on this system. Uh, it also has a plasma engine. And this is as we've got up to orbit. And so what we're going to do is uh, we actually got into an orbit with that thing. And then I realized that I needed to ditch the stage. So I turned the whole thing around, uh, fired the engine so that the stage slowed back down into an orbit which would return to the atmosphere. And now, thankfully, we do have a little engine on this thing, so we, it'll be able to push itself back into orbit. Sliding up in front of the object here, in front of our spent stage that will suffer a fate worse than falling back into the atmosphere. It will fall back into the atmosphere and hit the ground at some alarming speed, no doubt. But yeah, now we're just we've cleared the obstruction. We are free to accelerate up to orbital velocity once more, and fire up those engines, accelerate away, and say, "Sayonara, upper stage. We don't need your kind in orbit anymore. You are being sent back to join your friends in the wrecking yards of the upper atmosphere, or something like that." Yeah. Anyway. Okay, so we skipped the whole rendezvous because, frankly, it was yet another rendezvous. And you've seen rendezvous before, and they're kind of boring. There's lots of lines. And suffice to say, it took a little while. In fact, it says four hours. So four hours of simulated time. I orbited very carefully and eventually lined myself up. I'm coming in towards the reactor. The reactor 3 probe. It's actually, no, a reactor 1 probe. It's very hard sometimes to see in in, in post-production. Actually, yeah, no, it says reactor 3. The reason it says reactor 3 is because uh, I built my test rigs in another game and then I copy the, the completed reactors over. So, uh, yeah, Reactor 3 was the first one that was actually able to get into orbit without falling apart or, you know, being too wobbly. So, Reactors 1 and 2 couldn't make it into orbit, uh, it, it, although they were somewhat comical to watch. And maybe I should launch Reactor 1 and 2 just to see how ridiculous they are. No, we're just going to move alongside this thing. Again, it was... Unfortunately, pointed in completely the wrong direction, so I had to fly around it and then come in from the front. And of course, I skip most of the boring docking sequence because this thing is incredibly unwieldy and moves very, very slowly, so you really don't want to watch this in real time. Suffice to say, we do actually perform the union between these two large objects. That whole thing should be over 100 tons in orbit. Now, that is not exactly huge, but it's, you know, quite an appreciable object there. And we've got to ditch this uh, little drive stage here. We'll just transfer whatever liquid fuel we can from it, because liquid fuel is what we're going to use for the main engines on this thing. Um, 
yeah, we're going to turn off these little uh, Rockamax engines. We have no need for their kind on this. And then just decouple this upper stage. Of course, the upper stage is still equipped with RCS. It will be able to point itself the right way and head back towards the planetary atmosphere by the power of RCS engines. They may not have much power, but... It doesn't matter when you're in orbit, you have a lot of time to make that change. So you don't have much power if you have long duration, it's just as good most of the time. Unless you're falling towards the surface, in which case you want high power and short duration. And now it is time for the Kerbal Astronaut Corps' two newest astronauts, Hiramon Kerman and Arlik Kerman, chosen for their skill with nuclear technologies and their love for the colour green. They're going to be in charge of this uh, nuclear power satellite, which uh, is primarily going to be producing power and beaming it all over the place. At the core of it is a liquid fluoride thorium reactor, which Hiramon is going to uh, carefully get close to and turn on. And as soon as it turns on, he's going to get the hell out of there because, of course... Reactors generate all sorts of crazy radiation and stuff like that. And he knows that as though he likes the color green, he doesn't want to be glowing green. He wants just a healthy glow from, you know, being in the sun or something like that. Yes, the reactor is now running and hopefully we'll be able to return to the command module or at least to the lab and start using some of that power. We have a plasma thruster on the back and that we will use to raise this whole station into a higher orbit so that we can uh, beam the power to the satellites as they pass more efficiently. So yeah, the whole thing turns like uh, an oil tanker. We have a single docking port there. If I'd really thought about it, I would have flown up a bunch of struts that could be attached during EVA. That's another Kerbal attachment system feature. But actually, it's, it's okay if you just don't maneuver it too quickly. Yes, okay, we're now pointing the right way. We can fire up those engines. Wow, look at that, a whole... A whole point one, a whole one kilonewton. Okay, but we're not even at full thrust yet. Let's unlock this. 7.3 kilonewtons of thrust from that plasma thruster. Truly, this is a super new technology. Now... This is using liquid fuel, so uh, and it's giving me a specific impulse of 11,213. That's better than an ion engine. Look at that. Yes. Look at that massive thrust here. We Actually, uh, this is not something you could do with most other engines. I've got that engine running at more or less full power, and uh, I'm getting Arlick out of the, the crew can. So you can just kind of fly around in space and while this thing is accelerating at a rather slow rate like let's try and kind of get ourselves stationary and watch the acceleration happen okay just gonna let the thing accelerate there you see that that's not me doing it that is a spacecraft accelerating past us ever so slowly yes well we are going to try and take this up into a higher orbit it's going to depend on how patient i am how high we go is we have maybe uh i don't know it'll probably be like a maybe a 600 kilometer orbit ideally but we're not sure to be honest uh this is a liquid thorium reactor so it will burn out its fuel a little faster than the other one that's why we have the lab there it will do all the reprocessing for us and uh in the next episode we're going to start using some of that beamed power this thing will probably take ages to get up to the orbit and i'm probably not going to show you that because i can't fill that period of thrusting with interesting information. So instead, I'm going to say, see you next episode. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.